I actually did one. And uh, but anyway, I'll try and do sort of a few more um, now. Um, now that I can. Today's live chat is coming to you from the inside of my motorhome, where almost all previous live chats have come from. As always, uh, if you want to ask anything, please do so. It doesn't have to be related to the subject. 40 years ago this week, so today is the uh, 23rd of April uh, 2023, uh, 40 years ago this week was announced that uh, by Stern magazine in Germany that they had found the Hitler Diaries. All very exciting. It was a project which had cost them an absolute fortune. They had paid 9.3 million for the diary, uh, Deutschmark, sorry, uh, uh, for the diaries alone, uh, plus putting on a large amount of staff onto this project. As it happened, the project was to cost them long term a great deal more money. The uh, I have. I, I remember these incidents, um, I can remember very clearly. At the time I was a student in Lyon, in France, and uh, so I can remember Newsweek, the Hitler Diaries, are they real? That's how I remember it. With a copy of the diary with the initials FH on the front cover. Now, it, it didn't occur to me at the time it was meant to be AH on the front co cover, and I think when I saw it said FH on the front co cover, I thought it meant uh, Führer Hauptquartier or something like that. And um, anyway, it was supposed to be AH, but the person who did the diary didn't realize what the letters should actually be. Now to go back uh, a few uh, three weeks um, from from today, on the first of April, I want to do this uh, live chat. The first of April was the day that the Times newspaper, who had been informed by Stern at the end of March 1983, they contacted Hugh Trevor Roper, who was uh, um, who had written the last days of uh, Hitler and uh, he um, uh, he was asked by the Times to go to Geneva to see the diaries in a vault which were held there. Stern had contacted the Times with a view to selling the uh, Times or the Times group um the uh the, the 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 story rupert murdoch of course who owned or con and continues to own newspaper uh holdings in many places um uh he uh he um he was more than keen to get his hands on these diaries now anyway so uh, three on the first of April, so forty years ago. Uh, sorry, sorry. On the forty years after this event, first of April of this year, I decided I'd do this, but I, I couldn't. I mean, I was I was uh, because of the work, I was kept behind. But on the following day, I travelled from Heilbronn in Germany to Wrocław in Poland, and my plan was to go to Bernersdorf and film this there. Now, why Bernersdorf? Uh, if you saw the last video, which I posted a couple of days ago, Operation Seraglio on the 20th of April 1945, the um, Operation Seraglio was a plan of Martin Bormann's to evacuate uh, people and mountains of paperwork from Berlin to Berchtesgaden. It was clear that Ber uh, Berchtesgaden was, uh, sorry, Berlin was about to fall and so they wanted to continue the fight from the Alpine Redoubt. Ten aircraft left four uh, airfields and I've often see, heard it said that uh, the, the air, hello Isa, um, that the aircraft left from Gato Airport or what was then an airfield. Uh, that's not true. I uh, left from uh, Schoenwalder and uh, so there's 10 aircraft left from four, four different air, airfields and one of them was lost and the one that was lost 
when reported to Hitler, Hitler said, that is a tragedy. My, I want that one to survive so posterity would know the truth about me, or words to that effect. And uh, this was reported by um, a Field Marshal, or, or Air, Air, Air Marshal Bauer, who had been Hitler's Perf uh, not field marshal. He was a general. Sorry, uh, um, um, he'd been his Hitler's personal pilot, and that was it. Though that was it. Uh, what was inside that we know for a fact? There were ten trunks loaded onto that aircraft, each weighing approximately 40, 45 kilos, something like that, because it was only done by, but it was done off memory. The uh, there's a film 1981 film called The Bunker. You can see it on YouTube, and where it's not because it was nowhere near as good as Downfall. But then again, it was made uh, all these years earlier. But that film starts off with an American journalist who uh, later became the Newsweek um, uh, head of office in in, uh, in in Germany, and he went to the bunker by himself, and then he later he tracked down uh, Rocco Schmisch, who'd helped load the. Um, um the 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 trunks into the plane and they so between the two of them they sort of guessed how much the uh, the, the the trunks actually um weighed so anyway so you've got all this pile of stuff which came down over this place called Bernersdorf uh or the south of Bernersdorf in uh Saxon Switzerland in Germany and right to go many years uh, forward now the um by uh, by the 70s there was a huge amount of demand for hitler memorabilia and uh, um and this itself because the west german it was uh, government it was it was on the verge of illegality to it wasn't it wasn't illegal but it was it was highly interpretive how uh, possession or selling of this stuff were actually were actually go so a large part of this market went underground but added to this there'd been a lot of looting uh, not just by the soviets who did it uh, uh, or continue to do it uh, in ukraine today but um the, the looting had taken um, americans uh, french and british had, had, had looted as well and particularly in the south of germany uh, when hitler's uh, home of uh, the ober salzburg was uh, liberated uh, on the 2nd of May 1945. Uh, large amounts of property that were there, um, w which hadn't been destroyed, went missing and it went onto this market. Added to this were the paintings that Hitler had done when he lived in Vienna uh, as a young man. And these, at the time, um, Hitler was living uh, in, 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 well, in a, I think it was in like a more, say, a Doss house. One of the people he met there would sell his paintings. Hitler would do a painting of something, and then, then they would sell it and split the cash between the two of them. Hanish was his name. And so these paintings as well may have come onto the market uh, as well. So there was this, this, this huge demand for this uh, liberated or captured. Yeah, well, I would say, yeah, okay, captured if you like. Or uh, liberated, depends on the way you look at it. Um, and the, it depends on the way now... Um, uh, what, what, uh, sorry, depends on the way we look at it is to say what actually happened to the property. So this property... Uh, is now changing hands. It's got a, it's got a market value and all the rest of it. Now, October uh, two thousand and five. I used to be quite friendly with uh, David Irving, and uh, he told me about this Hitler cash cash on uh, turned up in West London. So he and I went there to West London. He went with his daughter and my my then my then girlfriend Monica, uh, and um, uh, we and there was this pile of i suppose one would call it junk i mean even eve's the word junk when referring to it uh in 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 the front room of this character's um uh house so at the back we had it went past a pile of cats because it seemed like his, his wife was in the um cat rescue or something then you walked into the room with the smell smell of urine presumably this was the cats actually leaving the smell of urine in there and then 
um, there was this pile of stuff. There were these Hitler paintings. There was a glass cabinet full of things which the owner said were um, mementos. I mean, to me, it didn't mean much. And one thing I recall very clearly, he said it was ever bronze glasses. And I said, well, I mean, I think the first one that would prove it one way, uh, certainly would prove it was not ever bronze glasses, was to check the optical frame and all the rest of it against her eyesight uh, and then test. And then maybe you have to start doing other things as well. There were paintings there. There was this copy of Mein Kampf that must have been, what, about 65 centimetres by about, what, what, 12 centimetres thick. It was um, there. This was, and it had the Berghoff stamp on it. And there was pictures with the Berghoff stamp. And then when I actually come round to actually doing the video, and I'll put the photos. So I, I thought I'd lost them, but I found them today. <laughs> and um, well, some of them I found today. I haven't got one of the Mein Kampf, unfortunately. So, um, so we went there, and this character, he wanted to sell his stuff. His father had been part of the Leibstand started. He'd clearly made a lot of money in the, in the 60s. He had a Rolls-Royce outside with a 1970 number plate on it. He had the cat house next door. And on the house next door, there was this um, painting of a woman with uh, five or six children. I can't remember. You'll see it in the photograph when I do it. I forget I'm doing the video. And uh, this was probably meant to be an allegorical uh, depiction of Martin Bormans. Hello, RJ. And uh, so the um, uh, this, I don't know if this is meant to be his retirement fund or what, uh, this character was clearly dying at the time. He was massively overweight. He had all sorts of problems clearly with diabetes. And as far as I understand, he died around 2007, 2008. I don't, I don't quite know. Uh, what, what happened to him as David Irving himself was arrested the following month in Austria he didn't actually get to handle the sale and find out what actually happened so there's this pile of stuff which may have had a huge value I don't know uh, but that just to me showed uh, what the demand for such uh, things uh, could be and uh, one of the characters who saw this demand but at an earlier age was a person called Conrad Kuyau. Conrad Kuyau was born in 1938 uh, in the Spreewald in um, what later became East Germany. He left uh, East Germany after being um, uh, found, he, he was caught stealing a microphone from a social club and he settled in um, Stuttgart and he found out that he had some fantastic ability as a forger. Now uh, Stern magazine was founded in 1947 or 48 by somebody called Henry Nannen. Henry Nannen uh, had worked during World War II as in a, pro uh, in a uh, Wehrmacht propaganda unit. He'd also starred appears to have starred in Lenny Riefenstahl's one of Lenny Riefenstahl's films and the um as a minor role sorry he was just there in passing you know I'm at, there's a couple of news things I'm in there just in passing but I can't say I starred in them and anyway so uh the uh this magazine Stern which had started started out all these years before and um it had it had progressed as sort of many uh, magazines have done and gyms such as Spiegel for example with a sort of more left-wing uh, bias although uh, as uh, within the 70s it was starting to show more naked women a bit like the sun or news of the world or something something uh, like that and I understand now that uh, the, 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 the tendency now is away from uh, that type of thing or has been for the last 20 years or so so uh, so it came in more of a bit more of a scandal sheet now uh, a person called Gerd uh, Heidemann he was a photographer. He'd worked. Uh, it's, he really liked photography. He got a job at Stern uh, in 1951. He was full time from 1955, but he was really well known for his uh, what he'd done for in Africa and the Middle East. Uh, he'd been a war correspondent. He'd been in the Congo and had a fascination for, for the, the rebels in the Congo. He came under fire in Jordan in 1970. Uh, so he'd, be, he'd been around a bit. Now he claims that he uh, he didn't have any interest in Nazi Germany uh, until he was actually sent to examine um, Hermann Goering's former yacht in 1973. I 
actually don't believe it, but uh, I'll comment on that when I get to do the film on Karen too, and I'll explain why. So Her uh, Hermann Goering had got a yacht in 1937. He uh, more or less told the German Automobile Association that he wanted it built for him as a birth, uh, as a, sorry, as a wedding present. It got, he got, so he got this ship built in 1936, 37. He, he commissioned it, and he, he used it quite a bit actually in in 37, 38, 39. And anyway, this ship. Uh, been taken over by the um, I'm getting phone calls. Uh, and um, uh, so this ship had been taken over um, by the um, uh, British uh, um, Army after the war. It was given back to the Goering family. Or Edda Goering got it. Her, uh, uh, Goering's ex, uh, sorry, sorry, his, his second wife, and she sold it to a uh, printer who sold it to uh, Gerd Heidemann. Um, and anyway, so Heidemann bought this ship, and he bought it. He said on an impulse. So it seems a very strange thing to buy an impulse. I'll go into them more when the uh, when, when the video comes to be done of that. But because of his uh, re yeah, relationship with Goering's daughter, and through her he met um, certain former Nazis, including General Wolf, uh, SS commander in. Um, uh, uh, in Italy at the end of the war, and a uh, major criminal, war criminal, or criminal, not just war criminal, he was a criminal, and um, Monka, uh, who was the last commander in Berlin, amongst other people. Uh, now, um, the idea was to, to invite all these former Nazis onto the boat and ho they hoped that once they got on the boat and they started getting themselves sloshed, then uh, they'd start telling uh, stories. As it happened, the idea was to call the uh, thing deck board conversations and uh, uh, Heidemann received a very generous advance from um, Stern for it. However, it didn't actually. Um, they, they, they got nothing of any value from from these ex or former Nazis getting themselves sloshed. It was just a complete waste of uh, time and money. Uh, nothing new came out of it. Although you would have thought uh, that something might actually have come out of it. So to uh, um, the strange thing was this is that this uh, seeing the demand though uh, somebody who knew one when um, uh, Heidemann tried to sell the yacht because he couldn't make he couldn't maintain the payments I and mean, it's absolutely ridiculous uh, the the costs were how would he earn and what he had to pay just to maintain the just the interest payments on the thing never mind anything else and uh, one of the connections which was recommended to him by Monka uh, in Stuttgart um, he was unable to actually through this intermediary to sell it, but he did find out as a result of this, he found out about the existence of a Hitler diary. And um, right, so um, on in on sixth of January nineteen eighty, Heidemann met Kuya. Kuya was then using the name of Fisher, and he saw the uh, diary. The very, the very first one. He prepared a prospectus for um, Stern magazine, and Stern magazine uh, then went ahead and bought the diaries, which were being written to order by Kuyao. And this brings me neatly onto the subject of the diaries themselves. I have read the diaries now. I've got to say, in fact, I'm going to quote uh, one of the people these, these diaries were sent to. Uh, one was sent for forensic analysis uh, in Germany, and it was sent. I can't remember the name of the person. It'll come back to me later. No doubt. And he said, "Is it words? Well, I don't care if it's real or it's not real. It's 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 really bad." And having read them, they are. Utterly awful. It is Kuya was more or less just copying things out of books, but he wasn't able to actually use his imagination to any great extent. And so occasionally he puts in one or two things he suddenly thought of. Who would have thought that Hess was this was this clever? For example, think things of this nature will occasionally appear, but on the whole, it is dreadfully tedious and boring. 
and um, the the reason that he was able um, Kuya was able to get away with it because it was written in old German script, which very few people could actually read. I can't read it. I mean, I had to, I had to read it in normal Latin uh, letters. So um, that was, and I think if anybody had actually been able, uh, or, or Heidemann hadn't been convinced and uh, by it, then that would have, um, that would have all come out. Now, uh, before, um, so I think I'll just leave that introduction there to, but I would like to say one thing, and it's this, it's that it's very difficult to believe that Stern was convinced into buying these diaries and all of it, but one, I think, needs to understand what Hugh Trevor Roper called was a, um, a journalistic scoop, that everything was uh, dependent on this, um, they, they couldn't check the facts because the scoop was more important. As the scoop was more important, one has to understand the mentality of the not only the people who are buying it, whether it be Newsweek in the United States or the Times group in uh, Rupert Murdoch in the United Kingdom, or uh, or Stern themselves. So they thought they had this thing, which then would create a fantastic amount of cash for them. That's number one. And two, it's the people who really wanted to believe. I mean, we see this all the time. People are so, they really want to believe that they throw all logic out of the window. And just to give one solitary example. Uh, now, I admit I know nothing about painting. And, but, but there was one thing. Uh, Kuya produced a painting of uh, Hitler's niece, Geli Rabau without clothes, a nude picture of her. Now, I don't know anything about painting, but I know perfectly well that Hitler would never have done something like that. And this was where the problem li lay, I think, to a large extent, that nobody bothered to, to try and get inside Hitler's mind, which was what they were talking they were doing, and think, would he have done it or wouldn't he have done it? And just, uh, and furthermore, I mean, Monka said, in 1980, that parts of the, li the, 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 the diaries which Heidemann told him about were not true because he was there on the day, for example, Leibstandarte was um, uh, initiated, inaugurated in Berlin in May 1933, I think it was. And uh, he was there and uh, it didn't happen in the way that Heidemann told him. And they, they, I mean, they, it could have been stopped so much earlier, but Heidemann was one of the true believers. He was somebody, he wanted it to be true. I mean, there's lots of things we all want to be true uh, and often turn out not to be. It's a bit like the, uh, the husband who's um, betraying his wife, but his wife will not believe anything. All the stories that she hears, it doesn't, it, it would, even if she caught them, uh, her husband would turn around and say, who are you going to believe? me or your lying eyes and that is the way i see it good so anyway i'm going to be publishing more videos uh, on this uh subject and um if you're interested i hope that you will watch but for the moment thanks very much for watching wonderful sunny day here in uh in poland and all the best from me for the moment so bye for now